Is Senator Lindsey Graham taking a page out of the Texas Democrats playbook? Graham said that Republicans should leave D.C. to prevent Democrats from passing an infrastructure bill, which he claimed would lead to an invasion of illegal immigrants and inflation. Let's watch. If for some reason they pass reconciliation uh, budget resolution to bring that bill to the floor of the United States Senate, the $3.5 trillion bill, you got to have a quorum to pass a bill in the Senate. I would leave before I'd let that happen. So to my Republican colleagues, we may learn something from our Democratic friends in Texas when it comes to avoiding a three and a half trillion dollar tax and spend package. Leave town. Hell yeah, I would leave. I'm not, I will use everything lawfully in my toolbox to prevent rampant inflation. A three and a half trillion dollar infrastructure package that's got nothing to do with infrastructure, that is a tax and spend dream of the, of the socialist left. If it takes me not yeah. showing up to stop that, I will do it. I think he's talking about you when he says the yeah. tax and spend dream of the socialist <laughs> left. He, 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 cert he certainly is. <laughs> And so the, the, that threat is all the more important now because last night, uh, bipartisan infrastructure talks, uh, the wheels came off of them. Yep. It, it to me, it was always pretty clear that they were unlikely to go anywhere because they would give an advantage to Democrats in the midterm. Yep. Since when has Mitch McConnell voluntarily allowed Democrats to have an advantage in a midterm? When, when that could be avoided. Well, there's that. And I also think there's, it, when you have an omnibus bill and an incredibly close, closely divided Senate, and you have high levels of polarization in the country, that is a recipe for an impasse because there is so much for people to grab onto to make it not work. There's more that you can sort of hype up as an, an impasse or an impossible disagreement um, to make things, to stall that kind of agreement on anything. So I don't think, I mean, I think that we're going to continue to arrive at these points. The wheels will sort of start turning again, <laughs> and the, you know, the, the D.C. media will have a feeding frenzy in the halls of the Capitol, and then we're going to continue arriving exactly where we arrived last night. And the question then has always been, well, okay, well, what happens to the six or seven hundred billion dollars that is in this bipartisan yeah. package when it collapses? When it collapses, my answer has always been it would move into the $3.5 trillion package, and that will grow. Bernie Sanders uh, said that out loud yesterday. Here's Jake Sherman from uh, Punchbowl. Uh, Bernie Sanders says what we've all been talking about, quote, if the bipartisan talks for whatever reason fall apart, we're going to have to put physical infrastructure into the reconciliation. So $3.5 trillion will go up. That is, to me, common sense. This started as hard infrastructure, mm -hmm. roads and bridges, broadband. There are uh, there are sig significant things that the country has agreed on a bipartisan pace basis have been needed for a very long time. If you don't get them done in the bipartisan package, clearly they move into the into the 3.5 trillion. They're not they're not going to just leave them on the table and say, oh well, it's too bad that we couldn't get McConnell to agree with that. So that raises the stakes of the the 3.5 trillion reconciliation package, and then he, now here come uh, AOC and the squad mm -hmm. saying that uh, they might take it down if it doesn't have uh, all of their priorities in it. So he's not the only one playing hardball. Last week, AOC pledged to tank a bipartisan infrastructure bill. If the reconciliation bill does not include money for immigration reforms, child care, and climate change, mm -hmm. and so. I, I think a, a federal judge's recent ruling, and this judge had ruled the same way, I think, seven years ago or something, that DACA is unconstitutional, actually supercharges this effort to put immigration reform into this package. And then once you've put immigration reform into it, big, you know, big labor says, well, let's make sure we get our priorities in there. And then the climate, climate activists say, well, let's make sure we're getting climate in there. Um, do, you, do you see this continuing to expand that's a really good point about DACA because it's another reminder that you cannot sort of do all of these things. Right. When, when Congress fails, you're not successfully going to ram through all of your legislative priorities through the executive branch. It won't always last. Right. These so, are Gen Xers by now, some of these, some of these dreamers. Yeah. And, they, and so you're asking them to live their like, entire lives on the whim of the, fed, uh, uh, the federal courts. The judiciary. When Congress actually has a chance that, you know what, just 
Just put it in the bill. Yeah, and like we've always said, I mean, I think this is a lose-lose situation for Republicans, and that's part of being in the minority. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this is clearly, I mean, even, I think when you do the reconciliation bill, there is going to be, the stakes are so high with it after these months and months of negotiations that there will be something that works both for AOC and for Joe Manchin, because they can do so much now. As soon as they sort of cut the bipartisan part out of it, which I think they're probably eager to do, and I think Republicans actually are eager to do that Mm -hmm. because it's a talking point for both sides. They can both weaponize it. Um, And I think Republicans at this point are eager to sort of get towards that process (laughs) because they knew to some extent this was probably always inevitable. The sooner that you can just sort of get there and start messaging the death of uh, the bipartisan and the, what did Lindsey Graham call it, the tax and spend dream of the socialist left. The sooner that you can sort of jump to that messaging, the harder you can hit this bill before it's passed and you can create the narrative, you can drive the narrative. And so on the left, they now can spend time sort of working on what that would look like to bridge the gap between AOC and Joe Manchin. And I think they already have a pretty good Mm -hmm. idea. Right. Even if it drives the cost a little bit over four trillion, it makes the it makes it even more popular Mm -hmm. because nobody's against roads and bridges. You know, in 2009, when uh, Democrats broke for the, the August recess, they got absolutely hammered at all of these town halls yes. at home, and it almost derailed the entire project with people saying, you're going to pull the plug on grandma, and what's, what's with these death panels, and keep your hands off my Medicare, and uh, it was a, an awful a summer time. for them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this time, what are people going to yell about? You know, how, how dare you raise corporate taxes in order to build a bridge? How dare you do broadband in my community? I just don't see it having the same resonance as as monkeying with uh, people's health care. Yeah even if it was intended to expand it. No, it's a much easier thing to message, I think. Um, A much easier thing to message. That said, I do think this is still the target areas, as we talk about over and over again, are those educated suburban voters who both parties are jockeying for heavily because they're in swing states that can determine a lot. So I think that's still a place to watch, and that's still where Republicans are pretty confident that socialist messaging, anti-socialist messaging, and using the socialist branding works really well. I think that's why you just heard it from Senator Graham. And so I I think that is still something to watch. Um, The messaging is more more successful in certain parts of the country than it is in others. So I'll be curious to see actually how they handle it. Also curious to see how Republicans handle it, because there's definitely a mounting awareness on the right that they probably were using the socialist language uh, way too much in the years leading up to this point. Yeah, you think? Calling Bill Clinton a socialist. Yeah. 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 Uh, So, yeah, I mean, I'm really curious to see just from a message perspective how both parties handle this as you're saying during recess when that's the pitch is going to have to be made around the country and if they do actually manage to pass this four trillion dollar package it will be a political science experiment that we haven't really seen since practically let's say yeah. maybe the great society but back to the new deal where a, where a party is elected to do something actually does it and then runs on that record mm. and most political scientists say that actually doesn't work we'll see if like, they run on the record right. I mean, we'll see, because if if they're combining the BIF with the reconciliation bill, I think there's going to be a lot of Democrats who just want to run on the BIF that goes into the reconciliation bill and don't want to own the price tag. They don't necessarily want to own everything that's done on immigration and climate, especially somebody like Joe Manchin. So I think that's going to make it really. Uh, we'll see. Like in the in the in the soft one, the three point five trillion, you got you've got the child tax credits oh, yeah, that just absolutely. started landing this week in people's. Uh, bank accounts. You've got elder care. You've got funding for daycare. You've got you know the, you've got the broadband expansion. Absolutely. I think, I think you're going to end you know tax increases on the super rich. I think you might find people uh, actually do run on on that on that broader package. And this is the first time that I can think of that Democrats have actually married two popular things together: taxing the rich in order to pay for things people like. They ne- they haven't, for whatever reason, they haven't done that for 50 years. Well, because it's hard to, again, this is another messaging problem, and it's also a substantive problem. It's hard to project with confidence that the tax cuts pay for the priorities. And now, at this point, it's like, oh, four $4 trillion. Whatever. Yeah. Like, we're going to do dynamic scoring, and it's all going to work out. Don't worry about it. Yeah, we got it. It's covered. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's fine. Well, next on Rising, we discuss the border crisis, so make sure to hang around for that.